We are continuing our studies in the Gospel of Mark. We're in chapter 4. And we began that chapter last week. It is a chapter which is about the parables that our Lord taught. A parallel passage with that is Matthew 13, where more parables are given than, than in, in this chapter. But uh, we began with a lengthy passage last week, 20 verses. We'll have 20 verses in this one as well. But uh, we covered one parable last week, the parable of the sower. And so now the Lord continues on with, verse, with the parables in verse 21. And He was saying to them, A lamp is not brought to be put under a basket, is it, or under a bed? Is it not brought to be put on the lampstand? For nothing is hidden except to be revealed, nor has anything been secret but that it would come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he was saying to them, Take care what you listen to. By your standard of measure it will be measured to you, and more will be given you besides. For whoever has, to him more shall be given, and whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. And he was saying, the kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil. And he goes to bed at night and gets up by day, and the seed sprouts and grows. How? He himself does not know. The soil produces crops by itself. First the blade, then the head, then the mature grain in the head. But when the crop permits, he immediately puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. And he said, how shall we picture the kingdom of God? Or by what parable shall we present it? It's like a mustard seed, which then when sown upon the soil, though it is smaller than all the seeds that are upon the soil, yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants, and forms large branches so that the birds of the air can nest under its shade. With many such parables he was speaking the, words, the word to them so far as they were able to hear it. And he did not speak to them without a parable, but he was explaining everything privately to his own disciples. On that day when evening came, he said to them, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd, they took him along with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat, so much that the boat was already filling up. Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he got up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush, be still. And the wind died down and it became perfectly calm. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? How is it that you have no faith? They became very much afraid and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and our time of study in it together. Let's bow in prayer. In the 18th century, preachers like George Whitfield and John Wesley were known for what was called field preaching. They left the churches and chapels to preach in the open air. Uh, they really had no choice. The clergy of the Church of England disliked their message and barred them from the pulpits. But also the churches couldn't hold the crowds that came to hear them. And so they went out into the fields and the open air to preach to many thousands of people. They weren't the first to do that. Long before the Wesleys, Jesus went out to preach in the fields and did so for the same reasons. He was becoming unpopular in the synagogues and with the religious leaders, but 
Also, the crowds were so large that the only place they could gather was outside in the open air. And so, in Mark 4, he is by the Sea of Galilee, preaching to a very large crowd that gathered to him. That's how the chapter begins. In fact, the crowd was so large that Jesus taught them from a boat out on the water. He was there because of the size of the crowd, but still it was an appropriate place for the teaching that he gave. He taught parables, which he later explained to his disciples, revealed the mystery of the kingdom of God. They weren't about the nature of the kingdom, but the manner of its establishment, about this present age, what, would, what they would be doing and what they could expect before the kingdom of God comes in all of its glory. They would be fishers of men. That's what he promised to make them back in chapter 1 when he first called them to be his disciples. And what better place to explain their ministry as fishers of men than there where he was by the sea. He pictured the world where they would go to win souls for the kingdom of God. Isaiah described the world in which they would enter as being like the tossing sea. There's no peace for the wicked, he said. They, the wicked, the world are a stormy sea. And soon those fishers of men would be sent out on that sea. But the first parable in Mark 4 wasn't about a fisherman, but a farmer. A sower who went out to sow, who tossed seed widely in his field so that it fell in different places on different kinds of soil. There are four kinds of soil mentioned in the parable. And out of the four, only one was good ground. Well, that was what their labors would be like. A sower is the evangelist, and the seed is the Word of God. It is the gospel, and not all will receive it. Many will reject the gospel and do so for various reasons. And that could be very discouraging for the sower, for the evangelist, but there will be success. Just as there will be success for the spiritual fishermen. In fact, in Matthew 13, Jesus told a similar parable about a fisherman casting out a net into the sea. It really has the same idea as uh, throwing out seed in the field. God would fill the net with fish, just as here God will prepare the ground for the seed and uh, of, of those four types of ground, one will be very fruitful. Thirty, sixty, a hundredfold will come forth. And so too with the net that is cast in that other parable. God will fill it with fish. There will be souls prepared to receive the gospel that's preached. Many will reject it, that's true. But many will receive it. And that's the encouragement to the sower to the one who gives the gospel, to the one who is the fisher of men. And in the next parable, the parable of the lamp, the Lord gives further encouragement and exhorts them to be active in the gospel, active in gathering souls. He says in verse 21, a lamp is not brought to be put under a peck measure, is it? Or under a bed? Well, the, the question obviously expects a negative answer. No, it's not brought out to be hidden. Lamps are lit to light up a dark room. Which is the point of the next question. It's not brought to be put on, it is brought, it is not brought to be put on a, it is brought to be put on a lampstand, isn't it? And the answer to that, of course, is yes. The image uh, of, uh, of a lamp being put under a bowl or a bed may seem a bit odd to us as we, we think about it, but um, the lamps of that day were actually small clay vessels 
They um, had a small uh, nozzle that would uh, be for the wick that would go in and absorb the oil and, and light the, uh, the, the lamp. And, and it was about the size uh, of your hand. It could fit very comfortably in your hand. And so you can see it would easily be hidden under a bed or a basket. But what would be the purpose of that? That's the question that the Lord asks. Lamps are lit to shine. They are lit to give light, not to hide light. And that's the Lord's ministry. It is to be light, which is suggested here in the way that he phrases the question. Literally, the statement is, the lamp does not come to be put under a basket. Now, that's unusual language, isn't it? The lamp does not come. Well, lamps don't come. They are brought. But the way the Lord speaks of this lamp is it comes. And it's not just any lamp. It is the lamp, the light. It has the definite article. And that definite article, the, and that verb, come, seems to indicate that he's saying, speaking more than just a lamp or a light bearer, he's speaking of one in particular, he's speaking of himself. And at that time, his glory was hidden. It was veiled. It seemed to be that it was under a peck measure, under a basket, under a bed, veiled. The Lord had been careful about revealing his identity of who he was, and gradually he would do that, and he would do that. But he's careful about that. But in due time, he would reveal fully that he is the Messiah, and he is the Savior, and the light would shine. And at his return, the, the second coming, he will reveal the radiance of his glory as Israel's king. So while it was veiled to some extent, it was, he did not come as the light of the world to veil his light, but to show it fully. And uh, so it is in the meantime, when his revelation has come in the present age, his disciples, his followers, Christians, his re are his representatives. And as such, we are lights. We are his lamps. We are the ones that shine out for him. And that's what we're to be doing. We're not to be hiding it. Now it seems that what he's doing here in these images that he refers to the, the uh, basket and the bed, they may suggest to us the, the difficulties that we face in doing that. A basket was used in the marketplace. They would weigh out grain and determine how much would be sold and how much money would be exchanged. And so it may have suggestion of the marketplace and money. And the bed, of course, is a place of rest in the home. And in and of themselves, they're good. But they can be a problem in our own life when we think of money and rest and ease. And sometimes those are the issues in life that cause us to hide the light that's in us and the light that we're to bear. And that's what the Lord is warning against. That's what we need to guard against. Uh, the, the love of money, the desire of ease, hiding the light from others. We need to guard our hearts from that. We need to put the light out and not hide the light. We need to, to reveal Christ to those around us. That is, is the exhortation of the parable that he gives. We're not to be those that hide the truth that we have. It's to be seen in our lives. It's to be heard in the things we say. But for a person to do that, for a person to shine well and to hand the light to others, as it were, we, we first must learn and obey. And that's what the Lord says in the next verses, in verses 23 and 24. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he who was saying... And he was saying to them, take care what you listen to. By your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. And more will be given you besides. To the extent that a person believes God's word, to that extent, God increases understanding. The more we receive, the more we understand, the greater our understanding, our capacity becomes the more we will learn. But if the opposite is also true. 
Jesus indicates that in verse 25. For whoever has, he said, to him more shall be given. Well, that's good. That's encouraging. But then he adds, and whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. Uh, what he's saying, really, is there's no idling in spiritual matters. There's no standing still in the Christian life. We are either gaining or losing, advancing in the faith or retreating. There's no middle ground. As I say, there's no idling in the Christian life. And that's true, really, for everything. Uh, if a person doesn't use a skill, whether it's that of an athlete or a musician or a linguist or a, a, a salesman for that matter, whatever, he or she will lose facility with that skill or gift. But how much more important is it to be earnest in our spiritual life? And what makes that even more alarming is what the Lord said next, that whatever he has will be taken away from him. That was Israel. Life that it had, and it had much light all through its history. From the time Moses gave the law all the way through the prophets to the time that Jesus had come, it had light. But that light would be removed from it. It had rejected the light that it had been given, and so no light would be given. Well, I say that was true of Israel. I think historically that is what he's speaking of here, but it is true of the church as well. Think of the church at Ephesus that the Lord speaks to in Revelation chapter 2. And in verse 5 he tells them that uh, they are to repent. They had much truth, but they weren't truly responding to it. They had lost their first love, and he says, repent, or their lampstand would be taken from them. And so it is. Failure begins with not taking seriously the Lord's words. He says, take care what you listen to. I think we made this point last week, but it's worth bearing again. It's worth stating again, and that is that our response to the Word of God has serious results or serious consequences. Good results or bad consequences. This is not an idle time. This is not uh, something to take lightly. We are here to hear the Word of God. And whether we hear it or we read it, we're to take it seriously and respond to it. And that's what the Lord is saying. In verse 26 is a third parable, the parable of the seed growing. It has a close relationship to the parable of the sower, as you can see. Both describe what is occurring in the, this present age, the interim age, before the revelation of the kingdom of God, before our Lord comes and it, and it is established in all of its glory. But while the parable of the sower emphasizes the condition of the soils, good or bad, this parable emphasizes the vitality of the seed, the, the power of the Word of God, the power of the gospel. Again, the, the worker for the kingdom is a farmer who casts seed on the soil and goes to bed at night in the morning he finds that the seed sprouts and grows. How? He himself does not know. However it happens, and whatever happens is unobserved. He goes to sleep at night. He wakes up. Things have occurred. What the sower knows is he didn't do anything to cause its growth. Its power is a mystery to him. Verse 28, the soil produces crops by itself. First the blade, then the head, then the mature grain in the head. Now the key word there in, in the statement the Lord made is by itself. It's the word from which we get automatic or automatically. The seed contains the principle of life within itself. And the soil, when it's in the soil, it produces growth. 
So it is with the gospel. It is invested with life-changing power. The gospel has within it the power to affect change. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, the author describes the Word of God as living and active. As I've said many times, and it's worth saying again, this is a supernatural book and these words are supernatural. The gospel is supernatural. When it when it falls on good soil, which is to say when the chosen, when the elect hear the gospel preached, it bears fruit in faith and conversion. Paul would later explain in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6 where he wrote, I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. It's important, Paul would say, that I preach the gospel. It's important that people explain the Word of God. But ultimately, it's not my work, it's not Apollos' work, it's not anyone's work other than the, the Lord God who gives the growth. Well, that's what's going on here. Soul winning is difficult work. Just as farming is difficult work, or fishing is difficult work. Soul winning is too, it, but it is supernatural work. The farmer throws out seed, but he doesn't make it grow. The evangelist gives the gospel, but does it cause the reception or growth? God does that. He causes the light that shines in the darkness to dispel the darkness and cause the heart to change and respond to the light that's given to it. And over the last 2,000 years, God has caused a lot of growth. The church has spread to the four corners of the earth, and that certainly is encouraging. But time is limited. Just as the growing season ends when the reaper comes, puts in the sickle, as Jesus said, and gathers the wheat, so too the spiritual harvest will come when the Lord gathers souls into the kingdom. In Matthew chapter 9 verses 37 and 38, Jesus tells the disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Now he's speaking there of going out preaching the gospel. We need more workers, he's saying. Pray that more workers will go and gather in souls for the Lord. That's the harvest. And yet there's another harvest as well. The prophet Joel spoke of it. It's a harvest of judgment. Joel chapter 3 and verse 13, he said, actually it's the Lord God that's speaking, put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe, for their wickedness is great. And I mention that because I think probably both of those ideas are present here. Both are what is meant when, we, when the Lord speaks of the harvest and the sickle. In the end, there will be a great harvesting of souls, many for glory and others for judgment. That has the support from the next parable in verses 30 and 30 through 32, the parable of the mustard seed. Jesus calls it smaller than all the seeds, but it grows into a large plant with branches that give shade where the birds of the air can nest. The work of God grows quickly from the smallest to the largest. Uh, just a word about what the Lord says there about the mustard seed. It's often a, a point of criticism with skeptics about the Lord's statement regarding the mustard seed as smaller than all seeds. It's not smaller than all seeds, not the smallest seed in the world. But that, that is not what the Lord was teaching here. It wasn't giving a botany lesson. His point was it was the smallest seed his audience was familiar with. The mustard seed was proverbial in Jewish literature for its smallness. And that's the point the Lord is making. Small and insignificant as it is, in, as, as its outward appearance is, it has within it 
the potential, the, the power to become a great plant, one larger than all the garden plants, as he says. So it is with the Lord's work in this age. It, it began like a small seed with Jesus, a baby in Bethlehem. When he died, the work was insignificant in size, small and discouraged. In fact, when the Lord died on the cross, none were believing. Or at least they were discouraged and scattered. Th those that did honor him with burial, uh, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, and even the women who came to provide the tomb and the body with spices, did so not believing in a resurrection, did so because they honored him out of love, but not out of hope. And the other disciples were scattered. So when they come to the end of the ministry, and with his death on the cross, everything seems to have come to nothing. And then there's the resurrection on the third day. And then uh, during that 40-day period, he appeared to a number of people. In fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 6, that he appeared to over 500 brethren. So from uh, a very small group of disaffected disciples and, uh, and friends, Suddenly there are 500 who are understanding and believing. Now that is a lot of eyewitnesses. That is a number of eyewitnesses, particularly when you consider that in a court of law, a, a point of truth could not be established except on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Well, here we have over 500. So in terms of witnesses, that's a lot of people. But in terms of the population of the Roman Empire, or even more, the world as a whole, it's insignificant. And so it begins small, but then we begin to read in the book of Acts, on the day of Pentecost, the gospel is preached. There's a, a number of people gathered in an upper room, and they go out and they preach the gospel as the Spirit of God comes upon them, and the result is 3,000 are saved that day. So now that number from 500 has grown to 3,000. And then we read in Acts chapter 4 and verse 4 that 5,000 were saved. And in between that, the Lord was adding daily to their numbers. So there was an increase. And soon the gospel would spread beyond Jerusalem to Samaria and then out to the Gentiles as Paul took the gospel to them. And so on. And it has spread. Have the Wesleys and Whitfield in the Great Awakening of the 18th century and many examples of that, so that the small seed became a big tree. Its branches spread throughout the world. It has become luxuriant, as it were, giving shade where the birds of the air can nest. Now, that all may simply mean this, that the work of the Lord began small and became great. God's people are worldwide and of all kinds of every group and nation like the birds are, sparrows and eagles, robins and crows, all kinds of birds, all kinds of people. So this was, this was more encouragement for the disciples. Don't, don't think that because the work is small that God is not in it. Don't despise the day of small beginnings. It begins small and builds big. We are predestined to succeed. Now there is a lot to that interpretation of the parable. There's certainly truth in everything I just said. But the birds in this parable are curious. The meaning of the parable really turns on the meaning of the birds. In the Bible, birds are often predators and represents something evil. Remember in Genesis 15 when God makes the covenant with Abraham and Abraham cuts up the animals and places them there and, uh, and the Lord doesn't come. And it becomes dark and Abraham is fighting off the birds. They are scavengers. Well, earlier in, in the parable of the sower, and the, so, uh, the sower and the soils, the birds 
represent Satan's agents. They snatch up the seed. They are, represent those agents of evil which oppose the gospel and snatch it up. So it's unlikely, it seems to me, that the birds would represent something bad in the first parable, which, remember, is the key to all the parables. How are you going to understand any of these parables, Jesus said, if you don't understand this first one? So it would be unusual to have that as the meaning in one and then a different meaning for the birds in this parable. That would be inconsistent and confusing. Now, this parable it seems to me, carries on the lesson of the first, the parable of the sower. It's about the devil and the wiles and schemes of the devil in opposing the truth and doing so with a counterfeit gospel and with counterfeit saints. It, it's the same with the parable of the dragnet in, in Matthew 13 and verse 47. Like the sower who sows seed in the field, fishermen cast their net into the sea and they pull up in it all kinds of fish, good and bad. So when they drag the net up onto the shore, they gather the good fish into containers, but the bad fish they threw away. And at the end of the age, Jesus says, the angels will take out the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now what Jesus is saying in all of this was the work of the gospel will succeed. There will be planting and growing in this age. There will be a mix of false believers with the true. Don't be surprised by that. Be alert. The tree will have birds. The net will have bad fish. The church will have wolves. But the Lord will give success to His work he will make a separation at the end of the age. In the meantime, during this age of sowing and reaping, of fishing, and all of the different metaphors that he gives, be encouraged and work. Now Mark writes that Jesus told many such parables. And he did not speak to them without a parable, but he was explaining everything privately to his own disciples. So he's hiding, as it were, the ultimate truth from those that he knew would not believe, but to his own disciples he was making these things clear and teaching a number of parables. These are only a sampling of the parables that Jesus told that revealed the mystery of the kingdom of God. And what the disciples would do in this age before the kingdom comes in its glory. What happened next shows who the king is when Jesus quieted a storm and ruled the sea. It was at the end of the day. It had been a long day. A day of teaching, which... Uh, can, can tire one out, and Jesus was tired. He needed rest. And so he told the disciples, let us go over to the other side. They left the crowd, set out for the eastern shore, while Jesus went to the back of the boat, lay down, and fell asleep. Well, the journey started peacefully. Normally it is a peaceful sea. It's, it's a small sea. It's seven miles wide, 13 miles long, and really more of a lake than a sea. And it's very scenic, especially in the spring when the grass and the wildflowers grow. It's surrounded by high hills and to the north is Mount Hermon with its snow-covered peak. But the geography that makes it so picturesque also makes it dangerous. Because when the cold air from the mountains and the hills come down upon that sea where the warm air is. That mix causes violent winds that stir up the waves. And that can happen suddenly. It did when the Lord and His disciples went out on the sea. There arose, there arose a fierce gale of wind. And the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. 
This was at the end of the day. It was, it was dark, which only added to the, the terror of the moment. But the really frightening thing was the wind and waves were violent and they were about to scuttle the boat. So where was Jesus in all of this? He was in the stern. He was in the back of the boat, asleep on the cushion. Now well, the disciples were in a panic, furiously trying to bail out the boat while Jesus was sound asleep. Now that's a picture. When all around him the world was chaos and uh, people were afraid and losing hope, Jesus was asleep. Not blissfully ignorant, not out of it. He was at peace. The disciples didn't understand that. His, his slumber didn't reassure them. Just the opposite. They woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Well, it certainly seemed that they were. They were in a real storm. What waves were filling up the boat? And they were fishermen. They, they knew what they were talking about. They knew that sea and its dangers. So they interpreted the Lord's sleep as indifference and rebuked him for it. Well, that's the sense of it. Don't you care? You're sleeping through all of this? The Lord answered them, not by speaking to them, but speaking to the forces of nature. He got up, calmly looked into the gale, and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush, be still. That can be translated, Silence, be muzzled. And the wind died down and it became perfectly calm. And suddenly, they were on a sea of glass in silence. Nature obeyed his voice. And then the Lord turned to the disciples and asked, Why are you afraid? How is it that you have no faith? The disciples were silenced. They were silent uh, at uh, the question that he asked. They didn't respond. They might have answered it. They might have said, well, the storm. It was real. It was an existential threat. They didn't answer anything. They were as silent as the wind. But the Lord had said, let us go over to the other side. That was his instruction and that was his purpose. And this is the Lord who speaks. And this is the Lord who intends. This is the Lord who had that as his goal. He could not be mistaken and he could not be frustrated. They were absolutely safe in that storm. They were safer in that storm with him than they would have been on the shore with the Pharisees. There is no possible way that boat could have sunk with Christ in it and his mission still before him. So, were they, were they wrong to have cried out for help? What were we to expect from them? Just to sit in the boat and watch as it filled up? What else could they have done? Well, they were actually praying when they said, Lord, save us. So, no, they weren't wrong in doing that. The, the, the fact that fishermen cried to a carpenter for help on the sea shows that they had faith. They believed he had the power to save them. They were looking to him for that. Their cry for help was the wise thing to do. The problem was their faith was weak. Now here in Mark it says no faith. In Matthew's account it is little faith. That's how we should understand the, the no faith is no, no faith as it should be. They had weak faith. That's what Jesus was correcting here. The Lord never rebukes us for praying to Him. We're told to pray without ceasing. 
We can't disturb him. We can't annoy him. He wants us to come to him at all times. Matthew Henry wrote, He does not chide them for disturbing him with their prayers, but for disturbing themselves with their fears. Well, the lesson wasn't lost on the disciples. The chapter ends with them astonished and asking themselves, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Well, the answer to that is given in other places in the Bible. The answer to that is given in the Psalms, for example. Psalm 65, where God is praised as the one who stills the roaring of the sea. In Psalm 89, you rule the swelling of the sea. When its, wa when it, when its waves rise, you still them. Who? Well, in Psalm 89, it's the Lord of hosts who does that. So who is this one? He's the Lord of hosts. He's the God of the Psalms. He's the God of the Bible. He is who Mark said that he is at the very beginning of this gospel, in the first verse of this gospel, the Son of God. He's the King of the kingdom of God. The, the, the kingdom of those parables is the kingdom that he rules. And when he comes again, the power seen on the sea will be seen over the world. He's alive today and enthroned. The author of Hebrews said he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He rules the planet. He rules the universe. He rules men and nature. And he cares about his church. In a few years, Jesus would send these men out into the world to sow the seed of the gospel. They would be fishers of men on what the prophet called the tossing sea. The world is like that. It is full of, of sudden and violent storms. So this lesson was important for them and would be a great encouragement later when they faced great trials, when they faced persecution, when they faced martyrdom, when they faced the discouragement of these people who have come to them and shown signs of belief and then fall away. That's a discouraging thing. They'll, they'll experience all of these things. Their faith would be tested again and again. And so was ours. This incident on the sea was a, a hazard of providence. We face those trials in life. We call them accidents, uh, mishaps, tragedies. But they're providence. They fit within God's plan. I can't explain to you always in, in every case how they fit, but they do. We get up in the morning, we set out on a, a day's routine uh, doing some, some daily thing like getting in our car, like getting in a boat for a routine trip to work. Before the day is over, we're in a storm. We don't know what the day will bring. But by faith in God's Word, we know who is on the throne governing the winds and the seas, the traffic, the economy, all of the events of the world. The lesson the disciples learned in the storm is one that we need to learn as well. We can follow the Lord with confidence. We can go out each day, live for Him responsibly, knowing that He is governing and He cares. And He will silence the storm and He'll calm the sea in His time and in His way. That will happen ultimately, completely, when this age of planting and growing ends with the coming of the kingdom of God. It will come. Time marches on, and each day brings us closer to the Lord's return. So, we go out on the sea of this world as fishermen. We go 
into the field as sowers. We go into the darkness as lamps who represent Christ daily until He comes, trusting Him in every situation. That's what He's encouraging His disciples to do. That's what He's encouraging us to do. And when He comes... He will come with his sickle to reap the world. Are you ready for that? He will gather you to himself or he will gather you into the fire. Flee to him if you've not put your trust in him. He receives all who do. And you who have, be encouraged. We should all be encouraged. He rules the sea. He rules the world. And he has a plan and we're to follow it and we'll be blessed by it. May God help us to do that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the encouragement that the Lord gives in this parable. Help us to learn the lessons and to be obedient and to see the fruit that uh, will certainly come through a life that's lived faithfully and words that are spoken accurately according to the gospel. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.